everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Engine Gremlin. In today's episode, we are going to start unseizing the engine. So stick around. All right, so this engine bay, as you may or may not recall, has been cleaned out quite a bit from the last time you saw it. The last time you saw it was actually in the barn, if I recall, back in Carthage, Missouri. And we did a check out and everything is looking pretty good. Looks like rodents haven't really chewed on anything in the, while they were in here. They were just nesting in here with the exception of one wire, this guy right here. Uh, I haven't taken the time to identify which wire this is just yet. Uh, my feeling is it's probably the AC condenser coil or AC condenser wire based on where it's going to over here on the front of the engine, but that's not really important right now. What's important right now is unseizing the engine. So when you're storing an engine or storing a car for long-term durations, um, obviously you don't want to drain the oil. Putting fresh oil in there is a good idea. Um, but don't drain the oil because you don't want moisture to get onto the components inside your engine because they will become susceptible to moisture rust, which is rust that occurs from the uh, moisture in the ambient air, in the ambient atmosphere. And that's largely what's all over this car is, is just the surface rust from ambient moisture from being in a barn for 33 years. Um, that's one of the biggest things that you can do. If you have the ability to occasionally go in and turn the crank for the car and allow that oil to get pumped back up through uh, and, and let it keep moving, that'll help keep parts lubricated and make sure that they stay oil resistant. And the most important thing that you can do is take out your spark plugs and put in what's called fogging oil. Now, fogging oil is designed to help store your engine and keep those cylinders and the cylinder walls lubricated so that the next time you try and turn the engine over or you know rotate the crank, those cylinders haven't rusted or gotten stuck to the cylinder walls, making it really, really hard. Now, unfortunately, this car was stored in the barn as is. You know, the last time it was driven, it just went straight into the barn and that was it. And that's okay, that doesn't mean that this engine is beyond repair. Engines become seized or rather unseized all the time. So there's a couple of different tricks. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is we are going to put some penetrating lubricant inside the cylinder so that that can keep going. Um, but before we can do that, we have to remove the spark plugs. But before you do that, that means that you have to pull the spark plug wires. And if you're going to pull the spark plug wires, the most important thing you can do is label your spark plugs because if you hook them up in the wrong order, the next time you turn that engine over, it's either not going to start or it's going to fire out of order and that can just destroy your engine and that's bad. So I've already taken the plugs out and I'll show you here. I've put pieces of tape and what I've done for the purposes of this is I've just labeled them one through six in order, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so that way, the next time I go to put the wires back on, I don't have to worry about putting them in the wrong order. I can just go one through six, done, easy as can be. Um, the next thing that you're gonna wanna do is you're, if your car's been sitting for a significant amount of time, you're gonna probably wanna put a little bit of lubricant onto these spark plugs. I'll pull one out here because I've already loosened them and I've taken it apart. But you might or might not be able to see, it's pretty crusty and it's pretty rusty. And the last thing you want is to be busting off the ends of your spark plugs, not only because they're sharp, but because that's what conducts your, your charge. So if you don't have that, well, you gotta replace the spark plug. And regrettably, I got a little impatient and I got a little bit uh, fat fingered and you might be able to see down here, I busted off two of them. <laughs> so whoops. Fortunately, I have replacements for those. I was planning to replace these spark plugs anyway, uh, just to get it turned over because 
Again, these are old, they're crusty, rusty. They're not gonna produce a charge very well. It probably could get, would be enough to turn the car over whenever we get to that point. But for now, it's just not, just not worth it. So uh, what I've already done is I've already taken these spark plugs out and I've already put uh, a penetrating lubricant inside the cylinders and I've been letting it sit for about a week. Uh, and now I'm gonna try and get the crank to turn. Um, some people like their own specific types of penetrating oils. Some people use their own mixtures. I knew a guy who would use a 50-50 mix of transmission fluid and something else. I want to say WD-40. The next thing that I'm going to be doing though, now that I've had that sitting, I tried getting it to turn over, putting a socket on the main crank bolt. And it doesn't have much of a moment arm. And when you're dealing with the amount of friction across the surface area of all the cylinders, it can be quite a lot to break that friction of, of where they've seized up. And unfortunately, the, you know, the little handle doesn't have enough moment arm to break it. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to pull off the fan so that I can get my breaker bar down in there and get myself a much bigger moment arm to try and get that crank to turn and get these cylinders to pull free. If that doesn't work, well, I've got kind of two to three options left. One, I could put an extension on said breaker bar and try and give myself even a bigger moment arm. There are limits to that because you don't want to exceed the torque capability of the main crank bolt. The other option is you could roll it out into the street, let it start rolling, toss it into gear, and then start letting go of the clutch and see if the momentum of the car via the transmission, then via the main crank, then via the cylinders is enough to get them to break free. Um, I don't particularly like that method because it could potentially put a lot of excessive force on your car. Uh, and I'm going to have to fix the brakes before I can do that because as you may recall, I had to pull the drums and the shoes off because they were all seized. So don't like that option. Hopefully we don't have to go that far. And the last option is, you know, we're going to be taking this engine into a shop to get a, a bore line home, the bore, the, you know, the the deck resurface, the whole, the whole works. We're gonna do a total engine rebuild on this straight six. And you could just take the whole engine out and let the guys at the engine shop deal with it. Um, they're probably not gonna to be too happy about that, but it's not something that they're unfamiliar with. Um, and it may cost you a little extra if they have to spend the amount of hours or time it takes to get those cylinders out. So, next up, I'm gonna pull the fan. Alright, so we got the fan out. Uh, not gonna lie, that sucked. That made me this close to running out and buying a pair of uh, ratcheting wrenches. To be honest, I'm, I might just go and get a pair because I have a feeling I'm gonna need that a lot more often on this car. So uh, yeah, so we'll get the breaker bar on and see if we can get it to free up. Okay, so we got the fan out. Uh, now we're going to try and see if we can get the main crank to turn over and free up these cylinders. Uh, now, on the 1968 Mustang, at least for the straight six, that is a 13 16 bolt size. Uh, I highly recommend that you get a 13 16 uh, because it is used quite a bit on this vehicle. It is the same socket size for the spark plugs, and it is also the same size used to remove the seat belts from the subframe. Uh, so, yeah. We're going to give this a shot. Hopefully it comes free. If not, we will move on to more drastic measures. Uh, you are going to want a stubby socket. You're not going to want a deep or a deep socket because otherwise it will not fit between the radiator and the main crank bolt. So that didn't break free, uh, all it did was tighten the bolt, and I don't want to go too far because the worst thing that could happen is I could exceed the bolt's torque limit and snap off the head in the crank, and then it has to be drilled out, I won't be able to try and turn this sucker over, and, and nobody wants that. So I may actually end up backing that bolt off a little bit 
because uh, I don't want it to be over torqued. I don't want it to be too tight. Otherwise, it's going to be creating too much friction on that main seal bearing on the on the crankcase. Uh, and that's just going to make the motor work harder than it has to. So, uh, yeah, time to move on to slightly more drastic measures. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the air filter cover uh, and I'm going to remove the valve cover and make sure that the valve train is nicely lubricated um, and then I'm going to try and put some more lubricant into the cylinders and then give it one more go. If that doesn't work, I will probably have to try and throw it into gear and let it roll down the hill. So uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> So we couldn't get the motor unstuck the traditional way, which was taking out the plugs, putting a little fluid into the cylinders, and then using a breaker bar. So that was a bust. So we moved on to the next solution. We put in additional fluid. We let it sit for a little bit while longer, about a week. Uh, then we rolled it down the driveway a couple of times and let out the clutch in while it was in reverse, hoping that the mechanical advantage of the momentum of the car combined with the gearing ratio of the transmission and the differential would be enough force to break the engine free. Regrettably, after many attempts of rolling it down and then suddenly coming to a stop, we were unable to get it to come free, so we moved on to our next option. So we applied a shackle bolt to the rear of the car and a jerk strap, also known as a recovery strap, hooked it up to the Suburban and pulled it up the hill along the street uh, and let out the clutch multiple times, hoping that maybe with a little bit more momentum that we would be able to unfreeze the engine. Unfortunately, that did not work either. So that leaves us down to one last option prior to taking it to the engine shop. And that is, we are going to take off the head. We're gonna take off the head and we're gonna bang on those cylinders and maybe put a little heat on there to free it up. So, that's what we're gonna move on to next. Now, before we get to any of that, we're gonna to wanna to clean out the engine bay, especially around the head itself, because we're gonna take off the head, which means any dirt that's laying around in there has the potential to fall into the cylinders and fall into the pistons, and we're just gonna to have to clean it up later. And since we're gonna to need to clean up all that stuff anyway, now's a good time. So, before we start pulling off the head, we're gonna spray it down with a mix of Simple Green and some Dawn dishwashing fluid in a spray bottle. We're gonna wet it down, we're gonna squirt it all around, let it get soapy, maybe scrub it a little bit to help it penetrate some of that deeper, gunked up grime and then we're going to take the pressure washer to it and we're going to start with uh, a siphon hose into the mixture fluid container that has the same mixture so that we get it all nice and soapy and it starts cutting through that grime and then we'll finish off with just plain water and then we'll blow it out with the uh, air blower and the air compressor so that we don't have any standing water that can sit around and rust and make things worse. Once we're done with that, we're gonna apply a penetrating lubricant to all the primary bolts and let that sit for a little bit so that when we go to take it off, we don't accidentally break any of them off and it just makes the job generally easier. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with that. Now before I actually start tearing out all the bolts and hoses and disconnecting everything, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to label everything, especially the hoses, because when I put the head back on, when we try and get this thing to turn over for the first time, I'm probably not going to remember where everything's go. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in order to save time and make sure that I don't mess up putting it all back in, together in the future, I'm going to be labeling all the wires, all the hoses, and any parts that I take off are going to go into a box with a label and a picture stating where they came from and where they go. So, without further ado...
so the valve cover's loosened. We're gonna open it up and uh, see what it looks like underneath there. When I did pull the uh, breather cap off, or the rebreather, I should say, or the reburn cap, uh, I did notice I was getting burnt smells, which doesn't excite me. I'm hoping that's just the age of the engine and the fact that the exhaust gets recirculated through this valve cover. So fingers crossed, but we'll get our first look at uh, what's underneath. So, looking underneath, definitely that burnt smell I was getting before. Um, I don't know if the camera light shows it too well, but you can just see the years of carbon and exhaust deposits. Uh, it looks like the valve cover seal has come apart in multiple pieces, which means it was no good at this point, which is to be expected and we were always going to replace it to begin with. Uh, let's take a look at the lubrication. Lubrication wise, let me get a better light. Let's see here. I mean, it looks, looks okay. Um, yeah, it's not totally dry, so that's good. Now, in these straight sixes, the valve train is not lubricated by the push rods. They're not hollow push rods. It actually has, uh, I believe it's towards the back, there is a flow path that's connected to the oil pump. Uh, and that's how the valve train gets lubricated with oil. For the valve train that we're planning to use, we're planning to use a 1.65 ratio roller rocker set from Yellow Terra, which is a company in Australia. Um, that is going to block off the oiling passage for this valve train, uh, which means that we will need to switch over to a uh, ball and ball hollow push rod with the hydraulic lifter so that we can get oil to the valve train and make sure that everything stays lubricated up here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and grab the camera and bring it in for a closer look. All right, so here is the valve train and it looks kind of rusty. That's not really not, it's not so much rust as it is just particulates that have hardened in the oil over time from the exhaust flowing through the valve cover to be reburned into the cylinders. Yeah, as you can see, it's not dry. Lighting may be making it difficult. Yeah, so it's not dry, so this should still move without really much effort, which means that it's really just the cylinders that are making it stick. So we'll get to work on trying to free up those cylinders, starting with putting in some more penetrating fluid into the cylinders themselves, and then we might have to roll it down the hill. But everything else is looking really good. This valve cover is in fantastic shape. Uh, I cannot wait to refurb this valve cover. Probably gonna get rid of the blue and may go with a full polish style design. Um, you know, I definitely wanna keep the uh, powered by Ford uh, insignia on there, especially since this is an original valve cover and it just looks great. So no reason why we can't keep this valve cover and make it look superb. So we'll probably have a polishing video tutorial way down in the future once we start getting this engine bay cleaned up. All right, it's time for a little show and tell. So as you can see behind me, we got the head off and you know, it was a bit of a pain in the butt. Had a bolt or two snap off, which really, really sucks, but Nothing that we can't fix. Uh, first things first though, little uh, pro tip slash common sense tip. Uh, do not remove a head all by yourself. 
or if you do at least pull the push rods before you do and make sure that you label them so you know which order they went back in so that the wear pattern on the roller rockers and the lifters is the same and you can identify which cylinders and which valves have been having problems maybe in the wear department and i didn't do that so uh it's late i've been a little impatient and i've really 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 been wanting to get this head off so i can bang on those cylinders to free up this motor and you know fortunately for me it looks like none of the push rods were bent uh but again i was impatient shouldn't have done that so save yourself some trouble now let's get to the fun part so looking at these the head gasket looks like it was in pretty great shape these rods let's see looking at the ends of the rods here oops wrong one you know, not too bad. They're nice and smooth. I mean, really solid. Yeah. Those look great. Those look fantastic. Now, the cylinders, as you can see, it looks like those have a bunch of crud in them. Now, I can't tell if that's from the head itself or just crud that was left over. My guess is it's crud from the head. Uh, cylinders three, five, and six have been draining. It looks like one, two, and four are not, which leads me to believe that they are the stuck ones. So we'll get some of this out of here, play around, and then we'll bang on them. Let's go take a look at the head. And first of all, I want to say with regard to this valve train, holy crap! This valve train is in phenomenal shape. You know, the springs are good. It looks like, you know, the gapping on the springs is great, or the lash, I should say. You know, the carburetor was, it's a Holly 1100 carburetor, or not a Holly, an auto light. Sorry, didn't mean to offend either party there. Uh, but, you know, it's 1100 auto light. It's fine. But, Still, the valve train, the lack of deposits that are on this thing, and the fact that it's still so well lubricated is just fantastic. It's great. Now, looking at this head, you can see better, you know, much more clearly, this was the primary fault with these motors, and that was the integrated single cast intake manifold that was above the exhaust manifold and this was terrible for several reasons one you have these very sharp 90 degrees in the intake manifold and they're undersized an engine is a giant air pump so the easier it is for air to flow through the engine the better it's going to be also air does not like to go to 90 degrees so cylinders one and six really really suffered on these engines in getting adequate airflow because anytime you have a sharp turn like this you have a pressure drop which means that less air is getting into that cylinder compared to the other ones so not a great design the other portion the exhaust also terrible partially because it is directly beneath the intake manifold and what happened is you would get these hot gases from this exhaust and you would heat up your exhaust gases or sorry you would heat up your intake gases and your carburetor which would cause vapor lock which as you all know is not great but also an engine likes cold dense air going into the cylinders and it was getting hot not dense air going into the cylinders especially if it was sitting in traffic and the fan wasn't going very much and it wasn't able to make a whole lot of airflow over that radiator so that was the primary downfall of this engine was this design and we're going to do our best to eliminate this we're going to get rid of this integrated manifold we're going to actually get rid of the head altogether uh, and we're going to go with new stainless steel headers we're going to do a dual three to one style design uh stainless exhaust that should help this engine just it should give it brand new life so I'm going to set the camera down for half a second so that I can use both hands to flip this sucker over and we can take a look at the valves. I have actually not had a chance to look at the valves, so we're going to be seeing this for the first time together. All right, so let's take a peek at these valves. So the valves 
don't look too bad. Here's the plugs. Now, I've cleaned off the plugs earlier. They look just fine. Um, the valves don't look too bad. There's a little bit of crud, so yeah, this was definitely what was causing those cylinders to get full of junk. It was just at the deposits on these cylinder heads. Yeah, right here on the valves. There's particularly this valve. You know, these smaller valves are really crusty. So, but overall, the head itself looks like it's in great shape. Really like what I see here. Now, it's a shame that we're not reusing this head because we absolutely could, you know, zero deck it, get rid of the deposits, give it a port job, all that things, um, which is fine, but we're going to make it even better. Uh, we'll probably sell this to somebody who wants it as an original part, or we might keep it since it is matching numbers. We will see. Uh, let us know what you guys think in the comments, what we should do with this cylinder head. But let's get back to whaling on these suckers. Okay, so we got the head off and, you know, I've already gone over the condition of the cylinders and the condition of the head. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to pull the push rods first and I'm going to keep them in order so they can go back right where they were because uh, even though we're not gonna run this engine very long uh, after we put the head back on and we freed up the cylinders, um, those wear patterns on these push rods does make a difference. I don't even think we're going to reuse these push rods because we're going to need to go through a hollow oiling design for the new head and the yellow Terra rockers, but that's okay. Uh, it's still good practice. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pull these out. I'm going to keep them in order and then I am going to start banging on these cylinders. Now, the first thing I'm going to do when I pull out these cylinders or start banging on them is I'm going to clean up all the residual penetrating fluid that I had in there earlier. And then I'm going out of each of the individual uh, cylinders, I'm gonna vacuum and clean out all of this, of these nasty deposits that were, that had fallen off of the head and into the cylinders. Cause they don't need to be in there. It's only gonna get in the way. Uh, and so here in a minute, once I've got all that cleaned up, I will show you how I plan on banging on the cylinders. Ooh, okay, so little thing to note here, I pulled this one out and it's pretty gunky, it's pretty sludgy, which tells me that, that uh, you know, that lifter maybe isn't in the best condition. Uh, it is a hydraulic lifter, maybe it has a blown seal or something, oil hasn't been able to really recirculate something in there. So that's not great, it's not what we wanna see, but we'll make it work. Now another thing I'll mention is they do make uh, engine part caddies that you can that you can buy for relatively low cost that allows you to actually put these in order. They have labeled slots and everything else for the lifters, the the push rods, all of that stuff. Um, I don't have that, and this you know I'm trying to do this as on much of a budget as possible. Uh, I've also been trying to use hand tools as much as possible so that anyone out there who wants to make their own resto mod or do their own resto mod or restoration on a classic car doesn't feel like they have to buy all the equipment in the world in order to do so. Um, so I've been trying to do as much as I can by hand. Maybe that'll change in the future, but in the meantime, you know, that's the approach. I swear. I have found so many rocks in this engine bay from these stupid mice. I have probably found 30 rocks in here. It's just, it's, it's absurd. All right, so I am ready to start hand, you know, wailing on these cylinders to break them free. Now the key is when you're breaking a engine free is you don't want to use brute force. You don't want to be relying upon the momentum of the hammer to push, actually push the cylinder. What you actually want to do is create a shock event. So you're not transferring really any load into the piston. What you're doing is you're creating a shock event that helps break up all that crustiness. Because if you're trying to rely on pure momentum and force, uh, you're liable to break something and it's not going to want to cooperate. So we're going to go through these cylinders a little bit at a time, just kind of, and the technique is to use something such as a hammer to swing down and stop just as you make contact with whatever it is you're using to apply that shock load to the piston. So hit and stop. You're not following through. 
Now, if you're uncomfortable with this, I recommend something smaller and lighter. Uh, this is just a hand hammer. I'm gonna be using a engineer's hammer or a hand sledge, uh, just because I feel comfortable with the amount of control that I have with it. Um, and what I'm gonna be using to transfer that shock load to the cylinders is just this little $3 galvanized steel pipe coupling. Now, the reason I've chosen this, it's a two inch to one inch coupler. The uh, reason I've chosen this is you can get them pretty much anywhere. They're super cheap. They're steel uh, or iron. I can't, I can't remember if this is iron or steel. I, th I think it's actually iron that's been galvanized. Um, the diameter fits nicely in there. It doesn't sit inside the dish, it sits outside. So on the rim of the cylinder, um, and more importantly, a lot of time, a lot of people will use like two inch pieces of steel pipe and they will set them in there and they'll bang on them. Unfortunately, steel pipe is a little harder to get in a specific length. So if you don't want to buy a huge length of two inch pipe, that's going to cost you a fair amount of money, especially with steel prices, what they are right now, get one of these guys. And if you need a little extra, you know, length to stick out of the cylinders, you can get one inch pipe everywhere you can get it everywhere and you can get it cut to length it's super cheap so just get it threaded and then thread it into the adapter and then go in there um some people use wood wood does not transfer the shock as well but you know if you're in a pinch and that's what you need it might take a little bit more banging on it but uh it should still do the job but in the meantime i'm going to use this guy So I've taken a few cracks on these, you know, it's going to take a little bit more time, but I want to take this opportunity to stop and make a few points. Um, don't just sit on one cylinder the entire time. Um, work your way around uh, through the cylinders. That way you don't put any undue force or pressure on the cylinders. Um, that's another reason why I chose something that's this big in diameter to weigh on the cylinders is because the bigger the diameter, the more that pressure is distributed throughout the cylinder and it's less likely to damage it. Um, but yeah, work your way through, go back. Don't just focus on the problem cylinders or what you think are the problem cylinders. You might have one that's stuck that maybe you didn't expect since you haven't been able to turn the motor over uh, or get the crank to spin. So work your way along. Um, I'm probably going to have to find an extension here for these deeper wall cylinders. But what you're going to be looking for to show that your uh, cylinders are unstuck is where they've gotten all crusty and hard. Uh, you're going to start to see that because the cylinder is going to move and you're going to find like those etch marks or those gunk marks along the cylinder wall. So keep an eye out that and that's how you'll start to know that your engine's starting to free up. Twelve seconds later. Twenty minutes later. Nothing yet. Two hours later. Definitely starting to get some movement out of these cylinders, but uh, not so much that I can do it by hand with the crank yet. Eventually. Hey! We got some cylinder movement! All right! So once you start to see some cylinder movement by moving the crank bolt back and forth with the breaker bar, uh, don't just go for it. Don't just keep wrenching on it because what you risk doing is over torquing the bolt and snapping it off and that's the last thing you want. So. Now that we've got some movement out of the cylinders, here's what we're gonna do. We're actually gonna take this breaker bar and we're just gonna, we're gonna go back and forth in both directions. We're gonna let that gunk just kind of work its way off until, and we're gonna get farther and farther in the sweep until we reach a point that we can actually get it all the way around. And once we've got it all the way around, 
We'll get it circulating, we'll let things get a little oiled up, etc., etc. Put the head back on and see if we can get it to turn over. Hmm. Pro tip! Don't hammer your finger with a hand sledge. Inadvisable. It really hurts. Mmm. Oh. Ah. Farts. Turd sandwich. Uh. Well, f Starting to move a little bit. Moved a little more. One eternity later. Welcome to the gym, everybody. It's arm day. Blow. This is stupid. I should leave that out. That's I don't know what I'm doing. Got a little more. We're now at top dead center for. I want to say four of the six. Cylinders, we've done, let's see, we've done two, three, four, and five, leaving just one and six left to get all the way to top dead center. And then I think we will have officially managed to get this sucker all the way around. There we go, come on, baby. All right, we did it. I did it, somebody did it. <laughs> I am exhausted after all of that hammering, because uh, it is well past lunchtime at this point. So I'm a little, tank's running a little low, car pun intended. But as you may or may not have noticed, we have all the cylinders unstuck now. My plan is to keep on ratcheting it, keep it spinning, keep breaking the crud free, wiping off the cylinder walls for any crud that I see really help get those loosened up, help the oil get moving around again inside the crankcase. Um, so everything can be nice and lubricated. When I come back, I'm gonna do some of the engine checkout stuff to turn over the motor while the head's off while it's convenient because I'm noticing some things down in the starter there that may be of concern electrical wise. And I'm gonna take the opportunity to check those out with the head off. So after a lot of banging on those cylinders, uh, we finally got the motor unseized, which is great, which is fantastic news, which means that not only is this motor salvageable, which we were relatively confident that it was from the beginning, but uh, it should be relatively easy to machine and uh, restore and turn into a modern motor. So. so as we're moving along, building the motor back up in order to get it over to turn over for the very first time, you know, there's a couple of things we have to check along the way. Uh, while we had the head off, we took the opportunity to check the starter. Uh, starter motor works uh, and it manages to turn the motor over just a little bit. I think our battery is a little bit low. Um, but now we're gonna be checking everything else. We've made sure that the valve train assembly is nice and loose. The push rods are moving up and down now that we're turning the motor over with the breaker bar. So everything's moving there, that's good. Uh, we've also able been able, bleh. we've also been able to check the relay for the starter. Uh, we started by bypassing it just to make sure that, you know, in case we ran into a problem, we didn't have that issue. Um, but now that we've we've checked the relay, the relay is good. We can actually use the starter from the ignition switch inside the car, which is fantastic. Uh, next thing that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be putting the head back on along with the valve cover. I'm not gonna be capturing that footage because you guys have already seen it. Uh, just play it in reverse, you know, it'll be, it'll be the same thing. <laughs> uh, so get all those tightened, get the head tightened back down, valve cover back on, make sure the valve train's still working real, real good. Uh, and then we're going to check the distributor. Uh, I believe it is a point style distributor. Um, we're just gonna be primarily checking for corrosion there. Uh, we're gonna be putting the carburetor back on, which I actually have here. Took the liberty of cleaning it off, lubricating it and everything else, making sure that it's free of any gunk uh, and the parts are working correctly. Um, 
carburetor's not going to do much in this case because we're not getting the car to turn over for very long, just a few seconds. Um, but still, better than not having one at all. Because uh, it also allows us to fill up the bowl if we need to and let it run for a little bit longer. Once we've checked the, the distributor and we've put the carburetor back on, uh, we will check for spark with the, uh, with the coil. Uh, once we verify that we have coil, we'll put the spark plugs back on. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. And then we'll start trying to turn it over and make sure that, see if we can. Spray a little ether down that carburetor and uh, see if she roars her life. So, fingers crossed. Oh yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you would like to be a sponsor, please reach out to us at enginegremlin at gmail.com. Any sponsorship or help that you could provide would be greatly appreciated. Also, please feel free to check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Links are down in the description. And also, please check out our Patreon page. Uh, any support that you can or would be willing to give there is greatly appreciated. It helps us make better quality content on a more regular basis uh, and really helps us out here on the show. And we would love to keep doing this. So thank you all so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.